people. So if you want to remain anonymous, you can close your cameras off, but otherwise we'd love to see your face. Um, so hi everybody, and welcome to the Gloucestershire Poetry's, Poetry Society's Raised Voices in celebration of International Women's Day 2021. And as I was saying earlier, last year we managed to hold a live event at St Mary de Crypt in Gloucester. This year, of course, things are very different. But our Zoom event tonight will be as varied and exciting for all that. 18 women poets will be reading one poem of their own and a favorite poem, <clears throat> favorite poem by another published female poet. <clears throat> Therefore, we will be raising 32 voices, 32 women's voices altogether. Let me just run through a few guide rules for tonight. Please, could you mute yourselves during each reading, but then unmute for applause, and we will give time for this, because I think it's quite important to applaud each reader. Um, also, you can leave uh, comments on the chat, which is a facility at the bottom, if you don't already know, you can put comments in there. Jason will also be putting the donation button. Uh, we will be um, donating proceeds towards two local women's charities, the Nelson Trust Women's Unit and the Stroud Refuge. We'll put the details on the chat now before we start. We'll repeat the link several times during the course of the evening. So please give generously if you can. Um, we are recording this event because we've actually had several requests to do this. We weren't going to, but people aren't able to come and they do want to see it. So that's what we will be doing. Our lineup tonight will be in first name alphabetical order, and I'll be reading my poems within that lineup. Um, I'll read out a short introductory biography for each poet in turn. Apologies to all for the brevity of these, but time is of the essence. And they have been written by the poets themselves. <clears throat> There'll be a short break about halfway through proceedings. And I think that more or less says it all. So without any more ado, I'd love to introduce our fo first poet of the evening, Angela France. Now, Angela is about to release her fifth collection this summer with Nine Arches Press. Angela cr teaches creative writing at the University of Gloucestershire and in community settings. So without more ado, a big warm welcome for Angela France, please. And now, if you'd like to mute, thank you. Thank you, Josephine. And thank you all for being here. I'm glad to be part of it. I'm gonna start with a poem by the late and lamented Helen Dunmore, Three Ways of Recovering a Body. By chance, I was alone in my bed the morning. I woke to find my body had gone. It had been coming. I'd cut off my hair in sections so each of you would have something to remember. Then my nails worked loose from their beds of oystery flesh. Who was it got them? One night, I slipped out of my skin. It lolloped, hooked to my heels, hurting. I had to spray on more scent so you could find me in the dark. I was going so fast. One of you begged for my ears because you could hear the sea in them. First, I planned to steal myself back. I was a mist on thighs, belly and hips. I'd slept with so many men. I was with you in the ash-haunted stations of Poland. I was with you on that great plaza in Berlin, while you wolfed tree donuts without stopping, thinking yourself alone. Soon, I recovered my lips by waiting behind the mirror while you shaved. You pouted. I peeled away kisses like wax, no longer warm to the touch. Then I flew off. Next, I decided to become a virgin. Without a body, it was easy to make up a new story. In seven years, every invisible cell would be renewed and none of them would, be would have been touched, any, but any of you. I went to a cold lake, to a gray lichened island. I was gold in the wallet of the water. I was known to the inhabitants who were in love with the coveted whisper of my virginity. 
All too soon, they were bringing me coffee and perfume, cash under stones. I could really do something for them. Thirdly, I tried marriage to a good husband who knew my past but forgave it. I believed in the power of his penis to smoke out all those men so that bit by bit my body service would resume. Although for a while, I'd be the one woman in the world who was only present in the smile of her vagina. He stroked the air where I might have been. I turned to the mirror and saw Miss Gather as if someone lived in the glass. Recovering, I breathed to myself, hold on, I'm coming. Yes. Beautiful. Um, this one of mine um, is quite an old one, but it is something that women of a certain age will recognise. Um, what it's like to wake up very hot in the night sometimes. But for me, menopause was a very positive thing. Um, there seems to be more room for creativity once we're not driven and haunted by hormones. So this is called the fallow blooming. She gasps awake from dreams of wildfires and deserts to find the sheet scorched in her shape. Hazy with heat, she staggers towards a cool shower, closes dry eyes and sighs as water spits and sizzles off her skin. Drinking through pores, she stands through days and nights. Steam clouds into mist, billows from the window, spirals to suck in air, heavy with spore and seed. Still, she drips and steams as lichen grows on eyelids. Tendrils of creamy roots twist between her toes and cluster under sagging breasts. Creepers drape shoulders, caress down her legs, insinuate over floor and under doors. New leaves unfurl, shine with moisture, drip on buds that swell, bloom and burst to pollinate the laden air. Hummingbirds blur to weave nests from hair. Jewel bright frogs nest on mossy thighs and next doors Errant macaw preens on her shoulder, indifferent posters on telegraph poles and trees. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. That was too brilliant. Um, thank you, Angela. Too brilliant. Um, oh, it's so Can good. Unmute yourselves, please, and give a really big round of applause for Angela Francis. That's a testament to that process. <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> I'd never heard that first poem either, and I thought that was wonderful. <laughs> I have a problem. I tried to write for the chat, but I find it very difficult if I'm listening because I miss. So I tend not to do it very often until the end because otherwise you miss really important bits of the poem. Yeah. But uh, feel free to do put your comments on the chat. Okay, thank you so much, <coughs> Angela. And now we'll go on to the next poet. The next one is Belinda, Belinda Rimmer. Belinda is joint winder, winner of the Indigo First Pamphlet competition with Touching Sharks in Monaco. Her chapbook, How to Be Silent, will be published by Dancing Girl Press. Please give a big warm welcome for Belinda Rimmer. Hey. <laughs> now if you can mute yourselves, thank you. Thank you, Josephine. I'm going to start with a poem by Julia Webb, and it's called All the Women. All the women, all the women are inside me now, shouting that this is a fine day for it, that they needn't have bought their brollies, their rain faces, their fold up cagoules. Whose voice is loudest? I couldn't tell you. I speak acorns and buttresses. I speak water lilies and doves. The day is a wedding and shortly we will all climb with our brimming glasses aboard a vintage double decker. But the women, the women, they are building their bakeries inside me. They are making baklava and baking exquisite cakes. They are replacing my blood with confectioner's custard and icing 
the insides of my breasts. And they are right. It is a fine day for it. The sky is smiling widely, showing its teeth of birds. No bombs are falling. We have 24 hour supermarkets and online shopping. And there are books, books galore on eBay and in libraries. We can pick them up and check them out. We can put them under our jumpers and take them home. But the women, the women are camped on the edge of the deep, dark pool. They are writing their epic poems on the inside of my skin. They are filling me up with shopping lists, chapters of novels, letters and bills. I am word confetti. I open my book beak and inadvertently sing. Oh, that's fantastic. And my poem is um, also quite an old one. And it's about being young and not really knowing how to express pain. And it's a long time before there was anything known about self-harming. And it's called Brittle. She ran the last bit, as she always did, turning at the edge of the wood, kicking up clumps of moss, ready to jump. She crouched. In a moment of release, she leapt, lightly lifting her bones, feeling the freedom of it. The ditch seemed to welcome her, the nettles in their bed of green, lazy white flowers slumping to and fro. She emerged on wobbly legs, skin blistered, eyes wide. She had to do it again from the other side, gathering enough pace to pitch clear, but letting herself drop. Nothing else had touched her this way. Afterwards, she dipped her arms into a cooling stream, pain dissolving in a spray of late spring. Thank you. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Belinda. Please unmute wow. yourselves and show wow. your appreciation. Wow. Witness. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Belinda. Um, okay, our next poet, and I've just been asked if I'll put the names on the chat line, so I'm doing that now. So bear with me. Our next poet is Carol Shepherd. Carol writes anything that comes to mind. Poetry, plays, short stories, and is trying to write a novel. She just loves words, whether writing, reading, or listening to them. So please give a very big warm welcome to Carol Shepherd. Hi, thank you. Uh, the poem I'm going to read is by Mary Oliver who was an American poet who sadly died a couple of years ago. And this is from her dream work collection. It's called The Moth. There's a kind of white moth. I don't know what kind, the glimmers it does in the daylight, in mid-May, in the forest, just as the pink moccasin flowers are rising. If you notice anything, it leads you to notice more and more. And anyway, I was so full of energy, I was always running around looking at this and that. If I stopped, the pain was unbearable. If I stopped and thought, maybe the world can't be saved, the pain was unbearable. Finally, I had noticed enough. All around me in the forest, the white moths floated. How long do they live fluttering in and out of the shadows? You aren't much, I said one day to my reflection in a green pond and grinned. 
The wings of the moth catch the sunlight and burn so brightly. At night, sometimes, they slip between the pink lobes of the moccasin flowers and lie there until dawn, motionless in those dark halls of honey. Thank you. And I'm just going to read a short one of my own, actually uh, still on the insect theme. It's called Cobweb Love, and it's for those people who've suffered from some difficult relationships. Your filigree love was beautiful, fluttering in the breeze. You lingered, vibrations rippled. You caught me in fine spun silk, glistening with silver dewdrop promises. You fooled me, words twisting in the wind, crystallizing in ice, until your delicate web began to break, strand by fragile strand. I untangled myself from you, took flight again. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. That was, they were beautiful poems. I love the last one too, really lovely. Please unmute yourselves, big hand for Carol Shepherd. Beautiful, Carol. Lovely. Okay. Um, I've been able to pass that job of putting the poet's name over to Peter, so I won't have to do that now. Um, yeah, super last line, Carol. Please look at the chat lines about your poem. Um, okay, whilst we are going on very smoothly, our next poet is um, Catherine Baker. Catherine's poems are rooted in her native West Wales and reflect, reflect her love for its history and people. She has been published in various magazines and anthologies. Please a warm welcome for Catherine Baker. Hi. Um, hello everyone, Shumai. Um, the first poem I'm going to read is by Lucille Clifton. And this poem is for the women who lack the opportunity to have female friends in their lives. The lost women. I need to know their names. Those women I would have walked with jauntily, the way men go in groups, swinging their arms. And the ones, those sweating women, whom I would have joined after a hard game to chew the fat. What would we have called each other, laughing, joking into our beer? Where are my guns, my teens, my mislaid sisters? All the women who could have known me. Where in the world are their names? Thank you. Um, um, this, this is my poem and it is dedicated to all the women who brought me up. Borrowing a mother. First, I borrowed my father's mum with her starch pinny, false teeth, watery eyes and hard, lovely kisses. Kittens and me under her arms and laughter always round the corner. Will Snots was smiling, polished to platinum with nails. A cabinet locked with pretties from her sailor husband. Never home but a doll found in every port. Auntie Vi let me stay, sleeping in Ida. Made cakes so light, she said they'd flo float out the window. Drank black tea, which was odd, and I'd learned to drive very badly in the war. Mam Brindero, her cheeks are soft and furry as a chinchilla, her house smelling of the sweet Welsh cakes she fed me until the bloody cancer ate her up, slow and skinny. Alison's mum only wore black, arms like a wrestler. I saw her pull a, a calf out of a cow, no trouble. She smoked a pipe in secret and taught me how to spit. Mrs Phillips up the lane always bought my sunny smiles babies and gave them names let me plant her vegetables and told me never to marry a man. Shans was exotic, 
They called her Esmeralda. She read my palm, said I'd grow up fat and happy, said not to wear short skirts or I'd have to powder my bum. Bessie Butchers gave me Dr. White's, said, hooray, babies! Then introduced me to amazing black magic. I liked Montelimar best, although it took a filling off. Flossy Pop ran the pub, and in between pulling pints, ironed everything, even knickers and socks. Let me have a go, while she had a fag and gave me a swift drag or two. Last of all, I borrowed my husband's mum. She could make beds with hospital corners, knew the value of a stiff drink, and how to tell you she loved you without saying it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine Baker, beautiful as always. And I just love all the different mothers you have. <laughs> <laughs> What an experience of life. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Um, our next poet is Chloe Jacquet. Chloe Jacquet is a multicultural, multifaceted spoken word artist with a preference for straight talking, rhymes, opinions, and biscuits. Big hand, please, for Chloe Jacquet. Thank you. Uh, my first poem that I'm going to read is taken from Aloud Voices from the Neurican Poets Cafe. It's called The Romanticization by Samantha Kerbel. And um, bit of a content warning on this one. And when he said to me, honey, you will be my only one. I thought of God, country and apple pie. All the things I'd been taught to believe in. So I believe. He would take me in his arms, holding me too tight. There's a lot of bad out there, baby. A protector of my frail little body, frail, brittle form. All doe-eyed and gushing affection, we gurgle and coo and promise each other. If we do it, it will be a bond of our love. It'll be forever, like world-class lovers. Water caressed the shore. Dawn met a gentle, drizzly fog off in the distance. A trio of blindfolded violinists played. He took me there on the shore with a kiss, gentle and wet, not too wet, soft, everlasting. Rolling in the sand, we made love for hours. No sweat, really not a drop. My lover lifted me, my limp, frail, brittle, little spent body carried off into the morn up to the house. Bathing me in scented water, sponging my skin, apologizing for making me his, his by the flesh, not the ring. When he said, I'm sorry, sweetheart, I love you, I believed. It's always like that when I remember. Blocked, shoved back are the fuzzy green dice over the rearview mirror, the glimpse of some kids, faces peeping in to see the car rocking, the seatbelt clasp wedged up in my shoulder blade diving deeper into my flesh each time you dove. I've even forgotten how things just got a little out of hand. A kiss hard and wet, all my chin was wet. A tongue made its way down my throat without first meeting mine. Wherever my top was, as you sucked my nipples raw, telling me I loved it like this. I'd lost track of your other hand. The one I could see muffled my screams with your flesh between my teeth. Until I heard the lock clank, heard the gates open, heard the flesh tear. How it burns, just the finger, then your dick, ugly, gangly looking. Not invisible and spiritually fulfilling. The glow the movies promised. Not slick, long, hard, like in porno flicks. Ugly, mean, poking in, missing the hole you dug. Instead you pushed harder, like to make a new fucking hole. Pulling out eight inches when you only put five in. Blind, gruff, bone dry. You kept on because you were almost there. Yeah, baby, I'm almost there. You're going to fucking take me there with this tight pussy of yours. Only a tight, tight pussy does it for me. Such high praise. Coming inside me, spilling all over the cracked vinyl interior of your daddy's Chevy Impala, parked in the parking lot by Beach 43rd Street. 
Sweat dropped off of your skin into my eyes. It didn't matter. I was already crying. My sweaty stomach only excited you more. I sweat even though I wasn't j giving, just taking from you. My sweat made you mad, crazy mad, horny mad. You were going to show me, give me a fuck. I'd never remember it would be that good, I thought. Good, now you'll have to stop. You couldn't hurt me again if your, as you said, little soldier wouldn't salute. That was too quaint for the scene, too little boy, too dirty old man, not a five foot eight, fair skinned male, age 17, last seen wearing a gray sweatshirt, blue jeans bunched around his ankles. Pushing me to get up and fix yourself, bitch. Apologizing for not making me his by the flesh because I ain't seen nothing yet. The only ringing was in my ears. When he said, whore, I should kill you, I believed. Morning came with hesitance. Memories are counted in days, months, years. For morning to come is to accept what really has passed. His hugs were always too tight. Um, and my poem, to lighten the mood after that, is about something that um, women do best, which is friendship. Is why I particularly enjoyed Catherine Baker's poem there. Uh, this is called My Friend. It's from my collection, um, published by Black Eyes Publishing, Josephine and Peter. So this is called My Friend. Just bring your lovely self, she says. But I don't want to. I want to leave my lovely self at home. I want to bring my bitchiest, grumpiest, rudest self. I want to abandon the self-censorship, the political correctness, the social norms, the control of my feelings, the biting of my tongue. And she let me, which is why she's my friend. Thank you. Fearless Chloe, thank you so much. Wow, that poem was quite something. Can I have a big hand please for Chloe Jacquet. <coughs> Right, now we'll carry on with Iris. Um, we were going to have Halima Malik here, but unfortunately Halima can't come until eight o'clock. So this is the one uh, break in our um, alphabetical order. She will come after the break. Um, so next up is Iris Ann Lewis. And in 2020, Iris had poems published in magazines, was featured on the Black Bow Poetry website, read at the Cheltenham Literature Festival, and won first prize in our Gloucestershire Poetry Society's um, summer competition. So please, a big hand for Iris Lewis. Yep. Okay, hello everyone. I'm going to be reading from Kim Moore's collection, a poem about a suffragette, um, Emily Davison, who was the uh, woman who was killed uh, on the racetrack at the 1913 Derby when she was hit by the King's horse. So this is a story about her by Kim Moore. Suffragette. And if you saw her hiding in the air ducts of Parliament, it was only to listen to the speeches. And if she set fire to post boxes and burnt letters, it was only certain envelopes she put pepper in. And if she threw a rock or two at one carriage or another, they were at least wrapped in words. Rebellion against tyrants is obedience to God. And if being imprisoned, her and a thousand like her went on hunger strike, at least no one died. The Cat and Mouse Act of 1913 sent the starving women out on license and brought them back when they were well again. And if an angry guard forced a hose inside her cell and filled it with water, at least she didn't drown. And if she hid in a cupboard in the House of Commons the night of the census, it was only to claim it as her official residence. 
and if her friends delivered themselves as human letters to Downing Street, but were sent back unopened, at least they made the news. And not knowing whether she chose to die, or whether in her dreams she saw the king's horse flying through the line, her sash around its neck. At least we know of the bruised shins of the horse, of the jockey, haunted by that woman's face. Wow. That's, that's Kim wow. Moore. Wow, wow, wow. And now my own poem, which was inspired by uh, that particular poem. Uh, All My Many Mothers. And if she sported a feathered hat, she was after all a milliner's daughter. And if she dreamt of ball gowns of silk, she could kilt her skirts and dance with her shadow. And though she could sing with the voice of an angel, the voices of girls do not blend with the boys, said the vicar, and sent her away to squeak with the mice. And if she bore a bastard child, at least the needs of a man were met. And if she practised herb law and witchcraft, the milk didn't curdle, and no one died. And if she snared a rabbit, stole some bread, it was only to fill the bellies of children. And if she spoke in the tongues of men, she could always be fitted with a scold's bridle. And though I see them through a glass darkly, I know their bodies are furred, their limbs are clawed, each one a wolf that howls in defense of her young. Thank you. Brilliant, Iris. Thank you so much. They were brilliantly read too. That's fantastic. Can please unmute and give a big hand for Iris I and Lewis. Fantastic, Iris. Iris. Thanks. And next, next, we have um, Jenny Farley. Now, Jenny is a published poet, teacher, and workshop leader. Her poetry has featured in many poetry magazines and in performance. Poetry collections are My Grandmother's Skating and Hex, both uh, published by Indigo Dreams. Please give a warm welcome to Jenny Farley. Woohoo! <laughs> uh, I've chosen a poem to read uh, by um, the American poet, Adrienne. And rich. She's one of my favorite women poets. In 1929, she was one of the most influential poets of her age. And her, they, it, it said that her feminist poetry is a revelation in brilliant imagery. Um, the poem I've chosen to read shows the independence of women. You're wondering if I'm lonely. Okay then, yes, I'm lonely as a plane rides lonely and level on its radio beam, aiming across the Rockies for the blue strung isles of an airfield on the ocean. You want to ask, am I lonely? Well, of course, lonely as a woman driving across country day after day, leaving behind mile after mile, little towns she might have stopped and lived and died in. If I'm lonely, it must be the loneliness of waking first, of breathing dawn's first cold breath on the city, of being the one awake in a house wrapped in sleep. If I'm lonely, it's with the rowboat, eyes fast on the shore, in the last red light of the year, that knows what it is, that knows it's neither ice, nor mud, nor winter light, but wood with a gift for burning. And um, my poem is <coughs> uh, a poem from my uh, collection, Hex, 
It's called Hippolyta, Queen of the Amazons. The Amazons must have been the first feminists, I think. I sliced off my right breast with my sword, the better to steady the bow and draw the arrow straight across the chest. I swore to forego motherhood and sex, so try to shrug off the shadow memory of a baby's milky breath, the touch of a lover's bearded lips. Now I braid my hair into a helmet, wear a breastplate of leather, bronze bangles, a necklace of the enemy's teeth. Like my scar, I wear with pride my sacred girdle, the war god's gift, as I lead my women into battle, urging our lathered horses onward. We've learned how to slay unflinching with sword and spear. Although vengeful killing is never our main intent, this is just to show men that we can. Thank you, Jenny, that was brilliant. Can you unmute yourselves and give a big hand for Jenny? Please. Hi, Jenny. <laughs> That first line of your poem always makes me cringe. <laughs> <laughs> you, you read so powerful. sweetly, so sweet, sweetly read, mm. such such barbarism. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. And uh, next up, we have um, Julie Allen. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, Julie's day job involves psychology and story and a dedication to supporting life's poetry. She is particularly pleased to have a poem about a typewriter exhibited in a garden in Sussex. Please a warm welcome for Jenny Julianne. Thank you. Um, Time flies. I just looked at the date, 20, 2016, Helen Mort's book. Um, no map could show them about women and mountains. And the poem I'm choosing to read is called Difficult. And there's a little verse at the top, a quote at the top, which says, God knows there are difficult women out there. Women who are at times shallow, bitchy, selfish, dishonest, and of course, crazy. And that was a quote from Ask Men, Why Men Date Difficult Women. Difficult women don't care what time it is. They're crowding the bus stop with their difficult bodies, refusing to budge for the light, or in the parks, dragging their difficulty behind them like a fat dog. Some of them are running, cycling, or worse, driving cars. If a difficult woman hits you at 30 miles per hour, you have a 50% chance of survival. At home, difficult women are more like walls than windows, but if you lean on one, you fall straight through. And sometimes at night, they show your face. Difficult women don't know they're born. Difficult women don't know the meaning of the word. There could be one folded into your newspaper, holding her breasts like oranges. There might be one carrying your coffee or moving to your road. In London, it's said you're never more than six feet from a difficult woman. Have you or a colleague had a difficult woman in the last six months? If so, you may be entitled to compensation. Do you have difficulty with our questions? Are you afraid you may be difficult yourself? <laughs> <laughs> so good. <laughs> Thank you, Helen Mort. <laughs> Um, my poem, uh, a short work, uh, and it's uh, titled For the Work of the Alchemists. And its first lines taken from uh, a 17th century commissioned engraving of a rather splendid alchemist laboratory. The engravers actually did quite well out of chaps with really good laboratories commissioning etchings 
to show how fabulous they were. And um, what with not being able to uh, learn Latin and uh, potential accusations of witchcraft, sort of any female alchemists have, have been rather low profile or, or maybe they just have better things to be doing. Uh, this poem is called Opus Alchemicum. While sleeping, watch. The leaf collector holds tattered skirts, catches autumn as the season darkens, cares for the fallen and the falling, while inside the sumptuous hall of scholars and knights, the alchemist kneels, seeks freedom from impurities, pins hopes on melting mercury to dissolve and coagulate his own nature. Four sisters, four fires, four elements to render his baseness pure. Outside, the collector stands cleansed by north wind, face to sun, feet dampened by earth, holds her arms open so rubies and gold fill her skirts. The scholars fear where the sticks will run. The leaf woman heads for the boat. Brilliant, thank you, Julie. That was brilliant. Please unmute and give a big hand for Julie Allen. And I do hope we're all difficult in some way or another. <laughs> okay, so um, it, it falls to me to introduce your host. Um, it's her turn. So, uh, Josephine Lay. Josephine is a published poet and writer of short stories, director of operations for the GPS and editor for Black Eyes Publishing, host of Crafty Crows and Scorpus. Josephine Lay. Thank you, Peter. Okay, I'm, I'm going to read a poem by Helen Ivory. I'm sure some of you know this, <laughs> The Anatomical Venus. It's a fabulous collection. And um, I'm going to read The Fainting Room. When they laced me tight this morning, my body split asunder. Clouds heaved themselves across my eyes. Nobody heard the crack of the rib or witnessed the small moth of my soul slip from my mouth. All day I felt the separation so keenly. Yet the household continued about me as if unaltered. When Nell came to dust the parlor, I feared for my soul, my little ghost settled on the mantel. At dinner, my soul watched from the wallpaper as I raised the soup spoon to my lips. There wasn't space beneath my corset for a single bite. I rose to reach my hand out, but her wings blurred ash. I felt the table and the diners fall away. I awoke inside this little room to find the doctor had been summoned with his new mechanized instrument. My binding had been loosed the doctor applied the treatment until a paroxysm possessed me. I breathed deeply of the whole earth. My soul flew into my open throat. My husband dropped some coins into his hand. Thank you. And the next poem, one of my own, um, it's a little bit about women who are still trapped even in modern life. It's an ekphrastic poem from uh, Edward Hopper uh, entitled Room in New York. A yellow rectangle in a black stone wall captures my attention, Fork's direction. This frame of load stone attracts and repels. Loitering between these two forces, 
I am static, looking in on the scene of voyeur. Two figures strapped in this flat roomscape. A man in shirt sleeves sat in a bloated armchair. A woman in a red gown leaning on a piano. One finger poised above a note, hesitating. Her gaze avoiding the score, projecting the tedium of evening, his retreat behind a broadsheet. She hits the note like the stroke of a metronome. Monotone, white light falls on her bare arms, skin bleached, leached of life. The man does not look up, raises the paper higher, a fragile barrier, but one she can't climb over or under. This scarlet bird in a canary yellow room. Behind her, the door is shut, a russet rectangle towering, ready to open if she'd turn the handle, put on dancing shoes, collect her coat, put the red back in her veins. He disdains to look at her, focuses his quarry on the printed page. Across a round table, they exist on the circumference. Her finger stops. No frisson in the fabric of her dress. I'm so close, if she looked, she'd see my breath upon the glass. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, that's our first half finished. Um, which is about right. So that's worked beautifully. Um, it's about five to eight. Can we stop recording, Jason, please? Back on. Uh, we're now recording. Um, and Jason is about to put the donation button for the two charities, the Nelson Trust and um, uh, the Stroud Refuge, if you would donate. Great, that would be very grateful for that. Okay, well, here we are back for the second half. I, I think you will admit that that first half was amazing. It really was. And do you know, it, it, the, the beauty of recording it is that I think I will go back and listen to those poems again, because when you've got so many going on, it's very hard to remember them. And I, I would love to see those readings again. Okay, well, once again, what we're going to do is, uh, while people are reading, please mute, and um, but when they've finished, please unmute and show your applause. So we're going to start off after the break with Catherine Oldman. Uh, are you there, Catherine? Yes, brilliant. Um, Catherine Oldman is widely published she previously chaired the Gloucestershire Writers' Network. She's presently studying an MA in Creative and Critical Writing at the University of Gloucestershire and is poetry editor for their, editor for their 2021 Creative Writing Anthology. So a warm welcome, please, for Catherine Alderman. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Josephine. This has just been the most amazing experience, all these women together reading fantastic poetry, so it's heaven. Um, so I, um, I noted that today, um, usually MP Jess Phillips reads aloud, sadly, all the names of women who've been um, killed by men uh, since the last International Women's Day. So I'm going to read my poem first because it relates to that issue. Um, it was published, um, I think, a couple of years ago on Places for Poetry, which is like an interactive map of uh, England and Wales. And it's set in uh, 1920s Birmingham, uh, where my um, Irish grandmother emigrated to from the most beautiful little village in the west of um, Ireland um, into extreme poverty, into the back-to-backs, um, and was unfortunately a victim of, of domestic violence. Um, I should say for um, anyone non-UK that um, referenced in this poem are fags and they are cigarettes, 
<laughs> and the black stuff <laughs> is what the Irish call stout or, you know, Guinness type of thing. So anyway, uh, and widow's dues uh, refers to war pensions. So it's called widow's dues and this is for Bridget. The fat check lands like a lardy cat hogging the doormat. 20 years too late to delouse the babbies or rumble the glacier shoring up the scullery wall. There'll be coal fired tonight, like cracked black eggs. A toast raised with a black stuff for his lungs soused in Passchendaele gas. Still, finally. No cheers for her pay spent like fags. Tommy the, Tommy the hero's trauma cured in ale. Kids locked in the carsy at his carousing, two lovely black eyes down the Brummagem back-to-backs. For this, she left salmon silver backing up the moy. Brent geese overwintering in raw Kalala Bay. Blood money, she called it. Her wages of war. Um, and so I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to cheer things up a bit now after that. I absolutely love uh, Angela Reedman, and I'm reading from um, her collection, The Book of Tides. And it kind of relates a little bit to this, but uh, I love it because the woman in this has a bit more agency. Um, and there's a, a footnote to the poem, which says, fishermen once held the superstition that some women could prevent storms by tying knots in a handkerchief. Such handkerchiefs were carried for a safe voyage and it's called The Sound of a Knot Being Untied. Look to your lasses, lads, if you can. Fingers slick with the art of her spit. She shushes out lamps and flaps on a nightgown before the candle is lit. You may wonder when being naked stopped being as simple as catching a woman bathe. Raindrops hung on the line as water rolled, anchored a collarbone to a pulse. You'll remember the snow, the winter you wed, moths at the shutters, a shy wife pulling an eider down over a breast. The pale of her skin seemed to spill out and lay on the cottage roofs. Shush horse prints and boots in the glass. The same woman can turn her back now and sigh scythes of frost to the window. Look, Listen to the slow combs of hair strands flying at bristles, a lightning in the room. She scrapes soap off her wedding ring, unknots a scarf and slips it over the silver, sly as a cloud across the moon. Look to that lass now, open a mouthful of sorries, kiss her while you can. Thank you. Brilliant. Two brilliant yeah. poems. Thank you very much, Catherine. Please unmute it and give a big hand for Catherine Oldsworth. Great. Ooh. Right. Um, so next up, we have Lucia Daramus. Uh, Lucia is a British Jewish gypsy Romanian writer and poet who has won Romanian and international prizes for poetry. She has Asperger's syndrome and schizophrenia. She enjoys expressing herself in a new language, English. Please, a warm welcome for Lucia Daramus. Hello. Uh, the first poem is um, written by uh, Nora Yuga, a Romanian poet. So, oh, how I cheat myself by Nora Yuga. How I shuffle my lovers, the living and the dead, in this tavern named poetry. I always relish being a coquette, black stockings, bright red nails. You know, it's very hard today to carry this shopping bag. This was first poem and my poem in my poem, I um, I have some lines in uh, in uh, Roman in uh, Roma language, in Spanish language, and uh, more. So, Ui by Lucia Daramus. Ames am Romnia, 
sam gela ba do casa, sam na cajine, sam su cara andi viaza, con marel, sam rabai kai trebul te has, sam musica anda ilo lumi, amen, sam romnia, amen, sam romnia. Somos mujeres, la canción del dolor, somos tristeza, somos el fruta de la vida, que esta murienda, apasionadas como somos, a probar frutas del sureste. Somos mujeres, somos mujeres. Somos música en el corazón de la luz. Somos mujeres, somos mujeres. It is the middle of our spring. Yes, our spring. And willows are crying under orange trembling of the sky. Trees, the beating soul of life, are kneeling ahead humans. In holy dark of spring, a woman feeds her baby. Her heart is fearful, yes, fearful, like a ship on a rough ocean under the fractured light. She is alone on the streets with her baby. Only the Milky Way is lighting her life. Make of yourself a light, said Buddha. Through his divine voices five, she is with her baby in her cuddle. She is a light, a light, a light. She never smelled a rose in a house, but she has a garden entire flight through her baby. Under the, the rays of moon, her child dreams easily, like a breath of rain under the sky. In the dark, stars are showing her a path to life. She begs from the wing a song. Swish, 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 the most beautiful lullaby for her baby. She is alone, alone on the streets in need. People are passing nearby. They are smiling. They are chanting. They are full of life. They do not notice this homeless woman. They do not smell the raw milk of the breast. Then they come, the four land men, with eyes as spherical as lunch bowl and eyebrows like razor sharp claws. They whispered, do you see this woman? I don't like a beggar in my town. Their words sounded like a wild fur droplet on my mind. The world is shining in shops windows. Exotic smells are arising from restaurants, but on the neat streets a woman, she is alone, alone, alone. A woman with her baby beyond stars, for this child in the soil is smelling of hope, hope. I hold out to the mortals. It is a fire in my soul and the blood in my feet, a strong wind in my breast and a wonderful desire in my feet. I'm walking, I'm walking along with this woman and along with another woman and others and the millions of other women because we are women, we are women. E maste, yunaikes, noi suntem femei, somos mujeres, noi siamo donne, mulieres sumus, ame sam romnia. Please, don't call this woman a beggar, or if you like, name all of us vagrant and vagabond, slogging our life and our drop of breath. This woman with her baby is in, a, is in a narrow cage of life. She has only her baby sleeping on this stuck road as a lack of hope on the teeth of a knife. She is a yard bird, but a yard bird is a, is a bird, is a bird kept, kept, kept singing in its own tomb of dream. A bird is dreaming to freedom, a bird woman to life. Leave us to live, to be alive, alive, alive. The woman of the street picked up her tears, leaving them to fly to the sky, caught by a predictable movement of a god spy. Do you know, dear lady, she said, maybe you don't believe me, but the food for today cost me in body language terms. It has turned me up and down, pulling me in a black, dark prison, prison of my body, in a dark, shallow space 
of this town. I wish I could play in a famous painting, having on my head a blue and golden turban, pearl earring and golden jacket, pretending to be enigmatic in a house with sofas and chairs, red onion cheese, potatoes on a table. But all of these are dreams in my crown. I need my soul in front of her dream, actually our dream, and gave her a rose to pop in her dusky hair. She smiled, a tear falling down in fist of a grains, together murmuring, you society cannot stop us blooming, the rights and our thoughts feeling turning away from the blazing painting of our vocation in our souls portray. We are women, the same soul of a working way. Somos mujeres, la canción del dolor. Somos tristeza, somos el fruto de la vida, que es muriendo, apasionados como somos. A probar frutas del sureste, somos mujeres. Somos mujeres. Somos música en el corazón de la luz. Somos mujeres. Somos mujeres. Ame sam romnia. Sam jilabadu kasa. Sam nekajine. Sam sukar andi viaza con merel. Sam rabai kar trabul te has. Sam música anda ilolumi. Ame sam romnia. Ame sam romnia. Thank you. Oh my God. Wow. I'm, nearly, I'm nearly crying That's here. Great. So beautiful. I love, I love hearing the different languages, poetry in the different languages. The music is amazing. Thank you so much for that, Lucia. Big, big hand, please, for Lucia Dalamus. Thank you. Fantastic. Brought me to tears. Beautiful. Okay. Um, next up, we have Maggie Clutterbuck. Maggie's poems are shaped mostly by her love of the Forest of Dean and her travels. She can't wait to get back to normal life, <laughs> neither can we. So with a big hand, please, a warm welcome for Maggie Clutterbuck. Thank you, thanks. Um, my first poem is um, by Jo Shapcott, who actually her ancestors are from this area where I'm now. And um, the letter, uh, the poem is a, a letter to Dennis, which is actually Dennis Potter, who is also from my area. So here goes a letter to Dennis in memoriam, Dennis Potter. Deep in the strangest pits in England, deep in the strangest forest, my grandfathers and yours coughed out their silicotic lungs, silicosis. England, land of phlegm and stereophonic gobbing, whose last pearls of sputum on the lips, whose boils and tropes and hallucinations are making me sick. The point is how to find a use for fury, as you have taught old father, my old butt, wherever you are. Still rude, I hope, still raucous and rejoicing in the most painful erection in heaven which rises through its carapace of sores and cracking skin to sing, in it, it, to sing in English. You are as live to me as the tongue in my mouth, as the complicated shame of Englishness. Would you call me lass? Would you heave up any stars for my crown? And... Um, well, the next poem's called Carol Lynn. So, you said she had a face like a can of worms. Unfamiliar simile to me, but of course I knew exactly what you meant. It was the freckles and the acne scars, mingling like an overcrowded party on her face. But her chestnut eyes and lashes, well, and those lips that pouted when she listened and flattened, when she spoke red and rich like raspberry jam. Then her breasts, the size of grapefruits, only sweeter, like a shamuti orange plucked from a citrus tree at Kibbutz Evron. 
Her hips swayed as she crossed a room, a belly dancer on the dusty floor of an Anatolian wedding, money stuffed into her skirt, midriff brushed by a calloused hand like a wingtip of a baton blue. Tanned by sun and brackish breeze, she swam naked at wrecked beach, a shadowy temptress beneath the waves, while you and I explored the cave nearby with our bodies. You opened the can of worms behind my back and they spilled into our bedroom. I slipped and broke my heart. The clue was in the simile. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. That was a lovely, brilliant poem. Thank you. Beautiful, Maggie. <laughs> Love it. Okay, I mean, I feel I'm going along too fast because all these poems are so fabulous. You almost need five minutes between to actually take them all in. But move on, we must. Our next poet is Maria Stadnika. Maria is a freelance journalist and a PhD researcher at UWE. She's author of Buried Gods, Metal Prophets, published 2021. The Geometric Kingdom, published 2020, and Somnia, published 2020. Please, a warm welcome for Mir Maria Stadnika. Thank you. Uh, the first poem is the poem Animal Planet by Anna Blandiana from her book My Native Land A4, published by uh, Blood Axe uh, in 2014. Less guilty though not innocent, in this universe where the laws of nature decide who should kill whom and whoever kills most is king. How admiringly they film the placid and ferocious lion as it tears a fawn to pieces. And whenever I close my eyes or switch off the telly, I feel that I participate less in the crime, even though the candle of life will always need blood to go on burning, the blood of another. Less guilty, though not innocent, I sat at a table with the hunters. Nevertheless, I loved to caress the long and silky years of the hairs lying in stacks like a tumultuous on top of an embroidered tablecloth. Guilty, even though I didn't pull the trigger and I covered my ears, horrified by the sound of death and by the smell of the shameless sweat of the hunters who fired the shots. Less guilty, though not innocent. In any case, more innocent than you, the author of this pitiless perfection, who set up this design and afterwards taught me to turn the other cheek. And um, the second poem is uh, my poem on earthing. Wash your hands, they say, after a day in the fields. A daughter with soiled dress must clean her shame. My preparation foretells starched days in rooms where everyone wears masks. Impossible to tell who teachers are. Forthcoming lessons surrendered to hunger at the back of a classroom, bound to kinship. Black flats passed down to barefoot offspring. Poverty chooses its bloodline with the same care storks roost in the tallest houses. Safe nest. Look for weeds in mid meadows. But when I bring home seeds under my fingernails, they oh. run the tap, scald my hands raw. Blisters grow over my lifeline. The elders bow to their fear. As in Latin, Timere is being afraid of unearthing aging blades. School days on hands and knees. My son and daughter 
born in mid meadows, raise their palms high at the back. Clean wounds face forward to honor their birthright. Thank you. Gosh, thank you so much, Maria. That was brilliant. Please unmute yourselves and give your appreciation to brilliant poems. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I mean, such powerful words happening here. Um, poverty chooses its bloodline. Very good. Um, so now we move on to Sharon Larkin. Uh, Sharon Larkin's poetry uh, books are Interned at the Food Factory and Dualities. She's Gloucestershire's stanza representative and runs Athon, I don't know if I pronounced that right, Athon Bridge Press and Good Dadhood Ezine. So please a warm welcome for Sharon Larkin. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for some superb poetry this evening. I've thoroughly enjoyed every poem that I've heard. And thank you, Josephine, for organising this. And also thank you, Peter and Jason. <laughs> right, two poems from me. The first one is, or well, they're both on the themes of domesticity, intimacy and fire. And the first one is from Christina Thatcher from her collection, How to Carry Fire, which came out from Parthian last year. It's called Most Days. Most days, I forget my body, the plump forearms covered in chicken skin, just like dad's, the purple marks that stretched up my stomach like talons after his death, I forget the perfect cigarette burn he seared into my calf, just out of socks reach, the tiny craters on my face. Most days I bump into you, don't notice how my feet move or where my arms swing, the girth of my belly, because I'm too busy listening to the sound of your voice watching you point at magpies, touching briefly the small of your back. It's only when you mention my softness or trace my freckles with the tips of your fingers that I remember my body again, the space it carves out, the bounty of it, the bounty it brings when shared with you. And my poem is Firewords from uh, my collection Dualities, which also came out last year. Firewords. We struck Vestas to light the fire. It went out repeatedly until ignition seemed to come from somewhere other than our own hands. And then the firewords caught. Now we must watch over them, attend to the flame, or the firewords will falter, our house will stay cold, and red letter days turn to black. So we rise early each morning to lay the hearth, make a bed for the firewords, their crimson font, and we stay up late at night to settle the embers before sleep bedded down between soft covers. We question the need to take so much care, suspect it could all be much less of a chore, but the effort is necessary for firewords are also bright children, hot with promise and rare reward. Birthed in years of vigor into our fumbling hands, the firewords grow become armour, protective in old age. Forged in the labour of fire, the fire of labour, they flare up in the ardour of attentive parents, come to rest in a child's innocence. Thank you. 
you, Sharon. That was brilliant. Really lovely, that second poem, too. Can you please mute and give Sharon Larkin a really good applause? Thank you very much. And now I have to apologise because I turned over the page and I missed two poets. <laughs> I really do apologise. The first poet is Marilyn Timms and then we will be having Halima. So Marilyn, please. Um, Marilyn is a chocoholic grandmother. I can relate to that <laughs> from Cheltenham. Deciphering the Maze, her poetry collaboration with her husband, Howard, was published by Indigo Dreams last year. Please, a very warm welcome for Marilyn Timms. Hello, everyone. My chosen poem this evening is by the prolific American novelist and poet Marge Piercy. In the 1960s, she was a strong agitator against the Vietnam War. Since then, she's published nearly 20 volumes of poetry and claims that a 1980 poetry collection, The Moon is Always Female, is a classic text of the feminist movement. It is her poem, The Friend. We sat across the table. He said, cut off your hands. They're always poking at things. They might touch me. I said, yes. The food grew cold on the table. He said, burn your body. It is not clean and smells like sex. It rubs my mind sore. I said, yes. I love you, I said. That's very nice, he said. I like to be loved. That makes me happy. Have you cut off your hands yet? <laughs> my own poem is another protest against the way some women see men as a commodity to be disposed of at will. It is a true story. I've merely changed the names to protect the guilty. <laughs> family trees. The family tree is like an English yew, familiar, evergreen, counting centuries, toxic, concealing family skeletons in shallow graves. Games, solid, dependable, built like an oak. Or Sophie, a silver birch, pale twist in the night, young enough to be his daughter. An arranged marriage, a business venture masquerading as love. Immortalized by photography, Sophie tends a sepia cardboard garden. Five tiny children strung out in a line, hoglets following a mother hedgehog. Poor Sophie, her spines are as soft as shadows, ill-equipped to counter fist or silence. Four miscarriages in quick succession. Only the intervention of World War I grants her womb relief. Searching for submarines, James discovers himself faces up for a stranger, admits an inconvenient truth. Men of oak bonding, death charges rumbling, sonar echoes, a heart beating time with his own. Peace. James returns home bearing spoils of war. Alexander, willowy, high cheekbones, hungry eyes, terrified of the law. Prison cells are small and dark. Love and trees need light and space to grow. <laughs> James besotted, slides away undergrowth, consigns the children to boarding school, locks his wife in a lunatic asylum, sets Alexander in her place. Uprooted, Sophie withers and dies. A new generation of saplings, echoes of Sophie, Sophie demand justice, awareness, a protector. They ask, how could it happen? The wind answers, very easily. She was only a woman. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn, that was very good. I, I, Sorry there was some noise there. I don't know whether it was coming from you, but I think everybody else is muted. 
So um, I do apologise if that was interrupting anybody. Don't but... worry, it's only me here. <laughs> oh, well, it, you've got ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ghosts are <is> lovely. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Marilyn. They were beautiful poems. Can you please unmute and give Marilyn Tims a really great round of applause? Thank you. And now, right, now, right. Oh dear, we've got feedback as well. I don't know what's going on. Um, so, Halima unfortunately couldn't be with us until eight o'clock. So now we're going to hear from Halima Malik. Halima is an artist and poet. She co-created the She Spoke project, uh, working with 25 women from Gloucestershire, merging poetry, art and textiles. She uses words to tell her story. Please, a really warm welcome for Halima oh. Malik. Yeah. <laughs> Please make sure I, I, you mute yourself. Oh, thank you, Tish. I can I recognize that voice anywhere. Um, I feel quite like, OK, I'm just going to do it. OK, so this is um, one by Kate Tempest. And it's morning after opening night. So that was it and it is done. And now the artist can move on. Behind him, what he has achieved, close, morals are grieved. Most days he can't abide the work, it spits from every seat. Most nights it sends him half berserk and turns his flesh to meat. A first night, a public showing, a winning smile, a finished poem, applying perfume to the skin of all the mess that lives within. Ideas are such perfect things, but soon as they've made real, they're cringing, clunking, turgid things so difficult to wield. That's what keeps him trying through. He'll stare till he's half blind. It's the search that will define him, not the thing he's trying to find. Seeking out a secret in the light, the rain, the traffic, a thing that makes him less alone, some sudden brutal magic. An angel in the takeaway who floods his face, sorry, who floods his veins with sun. The sentence that strangers say, a child having fun. Daylight on a dozing man, a damp patch on the ceiling. Anything can shake his hands and flood his soul with feeling. And it's worth all the agony, the wanting to be more. For that fickle ecstasy when he knows what he's for. That burning punch from paradise, eternal in the moment. When it's good, it's very good. The rest is all atonement. Um, Halima, we've got a suggestion. You might turn your volume down a little bit. We're getting a bit of uh, distortion okay. there. But was, we, we heard everything. It was fine, but just seems a little distorted. So give it a try. Yeah, turn it now. That's better. That's better? better. Yes. OK, yes, so you. I wrote a poem for tonight. And I just feel like where I am in my life and as a woman we have to showcase that we struggle as much as we are strong and I like my, come, um, come back a bit come back a bit from the mic again try again Ready? now try again so I find that women in that's our better. culture that's it my that's culture um, are always trying to show they're so strong and I get a feeling that people see when they see me. So I wrote this poem. It's just words, but it's just showing women that we struggle, but we're strong with our struggles. For all those women, for all those women who struggle every morning, every day to get out of bed and face the day ahead. For the exhausted mother trying to keep calm and strong in front of her children. For the mothers who struggle, yet keep a smile on their faces, stop themselves crumbling until they wave their kids goodbye at the school gates. We applaud you. For the women who keep picking themselves up after being hurt, mistreated, left alone to pick up the pieces around them and others, we feel your pain. For the women who have cried in the shower, screamed but silently, crumbled by herself, using the water as an excuse for her red eyes. 
I hear and recognize those silent tears. We salute you. For all those who have closed their bedroom doors, crashed onto the floor, covered their screams, covered their cries with their hands, and have felt so alone, I feel your loneliness. For all those women who have been left without a reason, left wondering what went wrong, why when she tried so hard, loved and gave it her best, I understand your fear and love to trust again. For all those women who have image their bodies, their confidence, who cover ask themselves without makeup, whose voice trembles when asking for help and speak out, I hear your voices. I recognize those masks. For those women who even while being in the crowd feel lonely, alone, unheard, whose anxiety is so profound, she silently breathes, praying she gets through the night unnoticed. I recognize your anxiety and fear. We salute and admire you. For all those courageous women who push themselves every day, give to others silently, lovingly, generously without asking for anything in return. For all those women who care for others, love and support their families, their friends, yet sit alone every night, hoping somebody will call and say hello. I have lived those evenings. We admire your strength. For those women who have laid in bed and cried so hard to the point you had to cover your mouth so you didn't make any noise, you did not deserve to feel that way. We did not deserve to feel that pain. I applaud you. I salute you. And this makes us the strong women we are. Thank you so much, Halima. That's brilliant. Please unmute yourself and a warm applause for a Fantastic, Halima. Halima Malik. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. I, I'd like to ask if it's okay, um, Josephine, Peter and um, Jason, if Halima is able to re-record re that piece. It's yeah. such an important poem. Yes, yeah. we will, and, we and will be in touch in. with Halima and try and work. You had some interference on your Oh, microphone. sorry. No, okay. we heard every word. Yeah. It's not a problem. But Such an important when poem. we put Beautiful. this out, maybe we can do a bit of a jig there. Yeah. We'll find out. I'll be back in touch. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Halima. Um, okay. Well, we are um, now coming on to Tish. Tish Camp. <laughs> Tish is a published London-born Trinidadian Irish feminist poet, artist and theatre maker. She performs in the UK and internationally. She is lipstick, boots, politic and verse. Please a big warm welcome for Tish Camp. <laughs> Tish! Thank you. This first one is Still I Rise by Maya Angelou. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Cause I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides, just like hope springing high, still I'll rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes? Shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries. Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard? Cause I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me down, shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise? That I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs. Uh, on the page, sorry. 
Out of the huts of history, shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide. Welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. Thank you. <laughs> okay, this next one I wrote today, and this is called When the Women Came. When the women came in the early darkness, a morning break from shells, they saw death, they pulled at their hair. On the beaches of blood, washed sand into their eyes as if handfuls of hopelessness masking pain that reached each pupil. In depths of despair, they held children amongst their mother breast, fed them tears, oh, how they wanted more. Eyes open, bodies now at rest, beds of death. They place water stones around, heavy incense fills all in mouths, in air, in prayer. When the women came, all peace could not be found. Wanting, they are oil. Oh, frankincense upon their bloated bleating. These deaths sung shrill as if killing sheep. Witness to war men, bargaining retreat, salvaging in ever sleep. Thank you. Wow. Oh. Amazing, Tish. Thank you so much, Tish. Please unmute and a big round of applause for Tish Kant. And last but by no means least, we have Zoe Brooks. Zoe's Hello. collection, Owl Unbound, was published in October by Indigo Dreams. Her poem for Voices, Fool's Paradise, received the epic award for the best poetry ebook. Please put your hands together for a warm welcome for Zoe Brooks. Thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm gonna read from my poetry idol. My idol is this lady, Anna Rachmatova. And uh, I remember very clearly first reading her and um, it was blown away and so much so I was, I was unemployed at the time. I borrowed the, her poetry book from the library and copied it out by hand. So I had a copy and um, she, to tell you background of her, she was able to do so much in so few words and nowhere more so than in the poem I get to read from, which is the Requiem. In it, she talks about when her son was arrested by Stalin's secret police. Her husband had already been executed for, for um, treason. She was in constant danger and she was unable to write down her poems. They were being transmitted by word of mouth. And yet when she died, the streets were lined with people coming out to honor her. And it's about a powerful woman, therefore, a very powerful woman, Anna Akhmatova. This is the opening of the Requiem. No, not under a foreign heavenly cope and not canopied by foreign wings. I was with my people in those hours there where unhappily my people were. In the fearful years of the Yezhov terror, I spent 17 months in prison queues in Leningrad. One day, somebody identified me. Beside me in the queue, there was a woman with blue lips. She had, of course, never heard of me, 
but suddenly she came out of that trance so common to us all and whispered in my ear, we all talked in whispers there, can you describe this? And I said, yes, I can. And then something like the shadow of a smile crossed what had once been her face. So that's Achmatova. Um, um, and I'm going to finish um, with the poem. I'm sure you've heard me read it before, but I like it. Um, it's called The Call. And it's about, it's a feminist poem and it's about domestication or not. The Call. You want me to stay a hearthkeeper, a filler of stoves and a bearer of logs. But the forest calls and all the small unspoken things living there listen. You want me to be a guard dog, a liar by the fire. You place dead meat in bowls to comfort me. But the forest is stirring. Can't you feel its mossy paws rising up the walls? Can't you hear it? It scuttles in the attic and leaps on nesting mice, tears their little limbs and chomps on innards. You try to keep out its cold, but the roof insulation is red with the death of vermin. As you pull your rug over your head, I feel my tail grow bushy, my snout lengthen, my teeth turn iron. In the morning, you will find my bed empty. Open the door and follow my trail if you dare. Follow it up the hill where the track skirts the ruined farm with windows black as the mouth of a hag -toothed, uh, gap toothed hag. Follow it past the heavy cows to where the snow will not melt in the shadow of the birch trees to the edge of the forest. I am waiting for you there. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Sonny. What a brilliant poem to end on. Brilliant. Please, can you unmute yourselves and give a big hand, a really warm applause for Zoe Brooks. And that is the end of our event. It seemed such a short time. It's gone so smoothly and beautifully, except for my one mistake. So thank you so very much. I'd like to just run past the um, poets in the first half and give them an applause. Angela France, Belinda Rimmer, Carol Shepherd, Catherine Baker, Chloe Jacquet, Iris Anne Lewis, Jenny Farley, Julie Ann Allen, and of course myself. So can we have a big round of applause for all of those poets, please? And then in the second half, Catherine Oldman, Lucia Daramus, Maggie Clutterbuck, Maria Stadnika. Marilyn Timms, Halima Malik, Sharon Larkin, Tish Camp, and Zoe Brooks. Another big round of applause, please. Thank you all so much. Now, we have put the, the, the donation button again on the chat. Please, please think of the women who are less fortunate than ourselves and hopefully today we can give some small amount to ease their burden and ease the charities that support them uh, thank you um and that is the end of our program thank you so much for coming and taking part jason and international women's day 2021 i dedicate my words to all those strong amazing women who lift each other, lift themselves up every single day, even though they may be struggling. That struggle, that inspire, that comfort and support everyone around themselves. For all those women, 
for all those women who struggle every day to get out of bed and face the day ahead, for the exhausted mother trying to keep calm and strong in front of her children, for those mothers who struggle to keep a smile on their faces, stop themselves crumbling and wave their kids goodbye at the school gates, I salute you. For the women who keep picking themselves up day after day after being hurt, mistreated, left alone to pick up the pieces around themselves and others, I understand your pain. For those women who have cried in the shower, screamed but silently, crumbled by herself, using the water as an excuse for her red eyes, I hear and recognise your silent tears. I applaud you. For all those women who have closed their bedroom doors, crashed on the floor, covered their screams, covered their cries with their hands and have felt so alone, I feel your loneliness. For all those women who have been left without a reason, left wondering what went wrong, why when they loved and tried so hard, I understand your fear to love and trust again. For all those women who battled a self-image, bodies and confidence, who cover themselves up with masks of makeup, whose voices tremble when asking for help, I hear your voices. I recognize those masks. For all those women who are sat in a crowd, yet feel lonely, unheard, whose anxiety is so profound, she's silently breathing and praying that she gets through that night unnoticed. I recognize your fear and I recognize that anxiety. For all those women who are courageous, who put themselves forward every single day and give to others silently, lovingly, generously, without expecting anything in return. For all those women who comfort others, who support their families, their friends, yet sit alone every single night, waiting and hoping somebody will call them and say hello. I have lived those evenings. I salute you. For those women who have ever laid in bed and cried so hard to the point you had to cover your mouth so you didn't make a noise. You did not deserve that pain. I did not deserve that pain. We do not deserve that pain. I applaud you all. I salute you all. And this is what makes us the strong women that we are. Thank you.